right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Again, I'm Dr. Nathan Goodyear. I am the medical director at Brio Medical here in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am a medical doctor, but I am also a, a medical doctor homeopath. So I, I straddle both sides of the fence of both conventional and alternative. And we are a holistic integrative cancer healing center here in Scottsdale, beautiful Scottsdale. And that picture is, it's beautiful. It's, it's what it looks like here. We have a great facility here. So who are we? We feel that we are the premier, we are the best, we are the leaders, we are the integrative treatment of integrative cancer treatment centers in North, of Amer North America, and I would say really North and South America, all of this continent. Uh, we focus a wide spectrum in what we do to heal people with cancer from IV therapies through nutrition, through lymphatics, through hyperthermia, through hyperbarics, uh, even through things like insulin potentiated therapy. We bring all of these together. We have patients from uh, domestic and international, and we treat all stages and types of cancer. Uh, most of our patients are gonna be advanced and recurrent, so we deal with very difficult patients. Again, we're here in the beautiful state of Scottsdale, Arizona. If you've never been to the valley, we have the best sunsets in the world. In the morning, the, the balloons are up, it's just gorgeous. What we are here is we're your focus, we're your center where if you have a disease, if you've been labeled with a can type of cancer, our goal is to focus on your healing. And we're gonna use natural and holistic therapies or even integrative therapies to do that. My education, I've been, I've been in this movement, integrative medicine since 2006. I cut my teeth in hormones and so I've written a lot about it. And uh, hormones are integral to wellness, but they're also very integral to the process of cancer but in a much deeper way than most are aware, and that includes oncologists. Uh, I've been uh, through that process. I morphed into cancer. It's really interesting how when you deal with hormones, how cancer becomes a, a center focus of that process. And then I've been dealing with just strictly cancer from a holistic integrative perspective now for right around five years. And it's been the best move in my life. And in, in terms of clinical medicine, it's, I'm doing what I want to do. Here in Arizona, it's amazing we have the ability to be, to be dually licensed as both an MD and an MD homeopath. That's why we're able to do things here in Arizona we can't do anywhere else, nowhere else. And so here we are. And so if you wanna come get these therapies, this is where you need to come to get these cutting edge, cutting edge therapies. You know, I think it's important when we look at history, Martin Luther King said, we are made by history. And I think that's important because history tells, tells us who we are. And if we don't know who we are, we don't know where we're going. And it's, it, it, it's really important to keep us grounded in that process. So adding to that, I like to say, you know, we learn from history to either make new history or simply to repeat it until we learn from our mistakes. So history is an opportunity to learn. And, and when you look back through history, you see that. Of course, the picture behind that, that little light bulb there, that's Linus Pauling. Many look back on the history of people like Linus Pauling, and they look at it as history, and they say, ah, that's in the past. We can't learn anything from that. But I can tell you, as it relates to the treatment of cancer and vitamin C, people in that age, 1970s, 1960s, 1970s, they did so much with so little, whereas today we do so little with so much information. So just a quick tour through history as it relates to vitamin C. I've actually read quite a few studies here recently published on PubMed discussing vitamin C. By the way, there's probably not a treatment that's more published in the relationship to cancer as vitamin C than any other. But a lot of them will reference that vitamin C research really began in the 1970s, and that's just not true. Um, and when you look at this history right here, you can see there William J. McCormick, MD, he was one of the first to really do research or suggest vitamin C has any impact on cancer. It's 1954, 1959. So that's not 1970s. Then uh, Ewan Cameron in the UK really did one of the first studies, ascorbic acid cell proliferation in cancer. It was 1972, so that was early 70s. But you can see this process began before the 1970s. It really began in the 50s. And in fact, even in the 1930s, there were people using high dose vitamin C of varying doses in the treatment of polio, and yes, even in the treatment of cancer. One of the first really good well-designed studies 
high dose uh, vitamin C was done by Ewan Cameron and Alan Campbell. Cameron was a, was a groundbreaking uh, researcher in this process. Uh, and that's back 1974. So again, we're talking about early 70s. Then we start to move a little bit more modern and a little bit higher dose as well. Dr. Frederick Klinner, um, he was using doses up to 30 grams of vitamin C. Now he used it for a wide spectrum. He used it for autoimmune disease. He used it for encephalitis, pneumonia, advanced cancer. So he, he used it in thousands and thousands of patients. Again, you and Cameron was very involved in vitamin C as it specifically rates, relates to cancer, even before his involvement with Linus Pauling. He was using 10 grams of IV vitamin C in terminal cancer patients. He, he coupled up or grouped up with uh, Linus Pauling, and most people recognize him as a two-time Nobel Prize Medicine Award winner for physiology and medicine, but it was really the two together that were working to treat terminal cancer patients. And they actually did so in two studies, 1976, 1978, where they were actually to statistically and significantly extend one year survival rates in these patients that were terminal and had nothing and no other treatments available to them. So those two together really coupled and brought together vitamin C in the treatment of cancer really to the public's awareness and, and science's awareness but it really, vitamin C in the treatment of cancer was really predating it by about 20 years. Moving a little bit further, Abram Hoffer, he was using 10 grams oral vitamin C, and this is an important point. He even saw a benefit there, but some studies we'll talk about in a second really show how oral and IV vitamin C are different. Then showing how it moved worldwide, Marathi and Yamaguchi looking at terminal cancer found prolongation of survival times with high doses of vitamin C. Uh, they were only using five to 29 grams of vitamin C. So as vitamin C doses go, it, it would be considered high dose. But here, when we're talking about the treatment of stage four cancer, recurrent cancer, we typically have to go much, much higher. And I'll dive into some of that in just a second. Now, the Mayo studies is not actually the Mayo brothers who helped to fund and start the Mayo Clinic, but actually it was three, these three physicians, Mortel, Criggan, and Fleming, who actually did research at the Mayo Institute, Mayo Hospital there in Rochester, Minnesota. What they did is they wanted to reproduce what Cameron and Linus Pauling did in 76 and 78. Now, one thing that they did is they failed to recognize that there's a difference between IV vitamin C and oral vitamin C. Not to really tear them down, back then that difference wasn't recognized as being significant or clinically impactful. But what they did is they did a double-blinded randomized placebo-controlled trial of 10, 10 grams oral vitamin C, and they found, so, found no benefit. What's interesting is in Cameron and these physicians, particularly Mortel, they got in this feud back and forth about who was right and who was wrong. Well, it turns out they were both right, but they both misunderstood the process of why IV vitamin C is the required therapeutic administration method for, for cancer, but oral vitamin C provides little to no benefit at all in cancer. So they were both right, but the problem is the messaging war, the narrative was won by Mortel and Fleming and Criggan. And so what happened is that closed, at least from a conventional standpoint and from a, from a media standpoint, that closed the debate on whether vitamin C was beneficial in the treatment of cancer or not, or not. But the problem is they misunderstood how oral vitamin C doesn't work and IV vitamin C does. And we'll touch on that in just a second. Then more modern, Dr. Reardon, um, Reardon Clinic in Kansas City, he really, he really brought a lot of the, the, the bench research and application of vitamin C to, to the mainstream and to everybody's awareness. And he, he did a lot of great research on pharmacokinetics and helped us to better understand this process of why IV vitamin C works and oral vitamin C does not. Robert Cathcart, he really took this to a whole nother level using doses of IV vitamin C up to 100 up to 300 grams, excuse me, on a daily basis in the treatment of advanced terminal cancer patients. 
So here, just a little bit of context, most of your supplements over the counter are about 1,000 milligrams, 2,000 milligrams, 3,000 milligrams. Dr. Cathcart was dosing upwards of 300 grams, as do we for some patients. And then Richard Davis, who I never got to know or meet, but he was really an entrepreneur and a physician, uh, worked with NASA, and he really took this to another level in terms of the 300 grams. And he really is bringing us to, together up. He's bringing to the market a, a, a form of vitamin C that we can all access and use for our patients. And so he actually succumbed to colorectal cancer uh, several years ago, but he was using 300 grams every day. And I know his widow and uh, she's a wonderful lady and she is continuing on his work uh, that he's done in cancer. Uh, so he was a gentleman that I wish I could have met. Now there's three other guys, three other people I'd like to mention that are, aren't on that slide. One is the name by the, one is a lady by the name of Jean Drisco. She's well published. She's at the University of Kansas City. Uh, great lady, very, very smart, um, really pushing the envelope in the science on vitamin C. Dr. Paul Merrick, who's done research on vitamin C, high dose vitamin C in sepsis, well published there, significantly reducing the mortality rate. And then Michael Gonzalez at the University of Puerto Rico, um, doing great bench research on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in the use of vitamin C. And these are more modern day people. By the way, I'm gonna be speaking at a, a conference in Florida for any physicians that may be on this or for patients that are here, reach out to your, your docs and have them go down to the conference uh, so, that we can, so that they can learn more about this deep dive of therapeutic vitamin C for docs. But for you patients, you're gonna to need to come to Arizona where we can introduce this high dose vitamin C for you because here in Arizona, we're able to do this underneath this dual license. So what's vitamin C? Well, there's really many different forms of vitamin C. And so what I say is with the real vitamin C, please stand up. Most of what you're gonna see out there is ascorbic acid. Now, ascorbic acid is pH three. It's very acidic. And most people, when they look at cancer, they're like, well, an acidic nature is not good in cancer. And that's true, but understand it's not the body wide. It's actually just in what's called the tumor microenvironment. But ascorbic acid itself is a pH of three. And that has a lot of issues, poor tolerability. It increases the acidity of the, of the body of the patient, which we don't want. So thus we come to what's called sodium ascorbate. Sodium ascorbate is simply just a sodium salt of ascorbic acid. And guess what? It has a pH around 7.4. So essentially what we're dealing with with sodium ascorbate is just one sodium molecule that's added to the ascorbic acid molecule, but it makes that big a difference in the pH and that it makes that big a difference in treatment because that pH of 7.4 is gonna have a huge impact on the tolerability of the treatment by the patient. The molar masses are different between the two compounds. The melting points are different between the two compounds. They are different molecules, but they are, they are separated by simply one sodium molecule. What's interesting about sodium ascorbate, it's naturally occurring. It's naturally occurring in citrus fruit. It's naturally occurring in vegetables. Ascorbic acid is not. I actually found this interesting quote saying, quote, sodium ascorbate is an approved food additive. I find that interesting because it's naturally present in foods. So when we, in a holistic integrative approach to the treatment of cancer, introduce therapies, we wanna introduce therapies that work with the body. And so sodium ascorbate is a pH neutral. It's gonna work better with the body. Again, it's naturally present in food. We don't want to introduce for, uh, therapies that work against the body. We want to introduce therapies that work with the body. And sodium ascorbate is one such example that does that. Now, a lot of people out there may say that vitamin C is not a vitamin. Now, this is a little bit kind of an esoteric debate, but I think it's important because you're going to see more of this. A Polish biochemist by the name of Casimir Funk in the late 19th century to early 20th century, he, he coined this term vitamin. And it was really coming out of what he thought and what a lot of people thought were molecules that were essential and 
required to sustain life. And they called these amines. And they thought that these were critical for life in Latin, that's vita. So they put these together and you got vitamins. And so these were chemicals or compounds that they thought were amines or like amines and vital to life sustaining uh, properties. But the biological function of vitamin C is not defined by a name. When you get down to the bare, bare knuckles of it, vitamin C is simply a, an electron donor. And we'll talk about that in a second. If you want to go, well, what is vitamin C doing? It's donating electrons and that acts as a buffer. And that actually acts as the means in how vitamin C can kill cancer cells, but not non-cancer cells or normal cells. Now, we, we as humans don't make vitamin C. We, we have inherited a preserved deficiency in an enzyme called glutolactic, glutolactone oxidase. Say that three times fast. This enzyme that we don't have dis, disables our ability to make vitamin C. And guess what we would make it from if we were able to? Sugar. That's why if you're ever getting IV vitamin C, and they check a glucometer or you know check your glucose your your glucose your vitamins is going to be your glucose is going to be sky high it's not because it's picking up glucose it's because it's picking up vitamin c and i think it's important too here to understand that these word origins have integral meaning and we need to recognize historically where they come from because these words they really apply the meaning to how we use these therapies today. If we lose the meaning, we, if we lose the historical context of what we're doing here, we really, we lose that historical foundation of what we're doing. And vitamin C is something that we have to recognize its origins because it, it's going to be an impactful treatment now, and it's going to be impactful treatment moving forward. So what is vitamin C? Well, it's a lot of things. First, it's vitamin C. Second, it is reduced ascorbic acid. As I mentioned, this is the pH three. When, a, when vitamin C or ascorbic acid loses or donates an electron, it becomes the oxidized, oxidized form called dehydroascorbate. A lot of that happens outside the cancer cell in what's called the tumor microenvironment. But understand that cancer cells can take up both that DHA and that ascorbic acid. It's taken up differently, different... Uh, pathways will take it up. So for example, what's called the glute receptors will take up the DHA and the ascorbic acid is taken up via uh, the SVCTs or what's called vitamin C dependent transporters. At its basic mechanism, vitamin C is an electron donor. So if you're looking at this from an organic chemistry or biochemical perspective, that's the answer. What's vitamin C? It's donating electrons. It acts as what's called a redox buffer so we, we think about pH as alkaline acidity, and that's a buffer system. Our body buffers that. So if we take in ascorbic acid as a pH of three, the body's going to buffer that because a pH of three is not suitable for life. It's gonna bring that up to a more alkaline of 7.4. Likewise, redox and oxidation is a buffering system and vitamin C is integral in that process. And that, that is also the mechanisms by which vitamin C kills cancer cells. There are those out there that are calling vitamin C a drug. Now, I've, I've seen this pattern before where a natural therapy has been called a drug and then the FDA regulates it and it no longer becomes publicly available. So obviously I'm a little apprehensive or a little biased about people starting to call it a drug. It's really not a drug. I mean, when you look at the word drug from, from word origin, it actually comes from the 14th century. So 1300 Anglo-French, it means any substance used in composition or preparation of medicines. Well, vitamin C is not a medicine. In the 16th century, it became associated with poisons. Well, vitamin C is definitely not a poison. And then in the 19th century, it became equated to narcotics and opiates. And it's definitely none of those. So I think when you look at the concept of how vitamin C is trying to be labeled as a drug, I think this is inappropriate and honestly, I think it's nefarious and it's an attempt to regulate it. So beyond electron donor, what we really have to look at is it's the delivery of hydrogen peroxide to the tumor microenvironment and the cancer cells. So the tumor microenvironment is kind of an environment by which the tumor and the cancer cells interact. 
No longer can one look at cancer as a solid ball of cells that isolates itself from the body. There is a zone of interaction. And in that zone, vitamin C does a lot of great work and produces a lot of hydrogen peroxide. So if you wanna use that drug analogy, which again, I don't like, but hydrogen peroxide is the pro drug. Hydrogen peroxide is the purpose of vitamin C. This occurs in, excuse me, outside the tumor cell, in the tumor microenvironment, and that cancer cell takes it up. And that is where all the action happens. That hydrogen peroxide goes through a series of reaction called Fenton reactions, where then this process depletes the cancer cell of glutathione. It actually downregulates NAD. It actually changes metabolism within the cancer cell and that triggers cancer cell death. It's an amazing therapy, but it has to be dosed right. It has to be dosed pro-oxidatively. And that's what the hydrogen peroxide does. Now, beyond the hydrogen peroxide, it's about the therapeutic effect or pharmaceutical ascorbic acid. So all of these labels or names are vitamin C. So they are all of these, but at its basic core, it's a pro-drug by delivering hydrogen peroxide, but it's an electron donor. And it's through these mechanisms in which it kills the cancer cells, but doesn't damage the healthy cells. That's the beauty of it. Two environments, healthy cells, cancer cells. High dose vitamin C kills the cancer cells and it doesn't harm the healthy cells. Study after study after study has shown this. So this concept, how can ascorbic acid, which is pH of three, and sodium ascorbate have a pH around 7.4, so neutral? How can one molecule, one, one, so, one element like sodium change the impact of the molecule that much? Well, guess what? When we look at hormones where I cut my teeth, we see that same, that same consistent um, recurrent theme. One small change in a hormone, in a molecule will have a huge impact. So progesterone. Progesterone is a hormone that women produce. Men produce a little bit of it, not much. Medroxyprogesterone acetate is the drug meant to mimic progesterone. There's this fascination, by the way, in conventional medicine with drugs. Progesterone is not a drug, it's a hormone. Well, when you look at progesterone versus medroxyprogesterone acetate, I wouldn't give medroxyprogesterone acetate to my enemies. It's a bad drug. Their half-lives are different. Their binding and circulation through the bud's different. I mean, medroxyprogesterone acetate even acts as a male hormone, what's called an androgen. It even acts as a glucocorticoid or a mineral corticoid. So it even acts as a steroid, though hormones are steroids. So one small, one small difference, progesterone medroxyprogesterone acetate can have a huge physiologic impact in how hormones will impact the body in many cases, the impact on cancer. Estrogen, same. When you look at estrogen, we have three types of estrogen here, estradiol, estrone, estriol. Estriol is the estrogen dominant during pregnancy, but these three estrogens, minor, minor differences. So for example, estradiol, there's a hydroxyl group at the 17 position. Estrone, there's a carbonyl group there. And then, and then estriol, is just different in its interaction with the receptors, but all three of these estrogens will interact with estrogen receptors differently. Estradiol will, will, benef will interact with what's called ER alpha higher, and that's more proliferative. Uh, so I, I said that wrong. Um, estradiol is one-to-one -one with, with ER alpha and ER beta. Estrone is dominant with ER alpha. So when, when a person has breast cancer and they say ER, uh, ER positive, that is estrogen receptor alpha. So estrone is the estrogen that dominates after, after menopause in women. And this estrogen gets produced from fat. And it is why it dominates after uh, menopause because it promotes breast cancer at that time and how it interacts with estrogen receptors. And then estriol actually has a dominant interaction with estrogen receptor beta, which is a counter-regulatory estrogen receptor to ER alpha. Little technical, but the point here is one small difference, one small change in a molecule can have a huge impact in not just signaling, but things like cancer. Testosterone, you know, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, 3-alpha understand down. All three of these are male hormones, but all three of them have different potency. They have different androgen receptor affinity. They have different doses, disassociation rates. They have different elimination rates, all because they have slight variations, not sodium molecule, 
some sodium element like what you would see in sodium ascorbate, but small additions, whether it's a carbonyl group, whether it's a, a hydrogen group, whether it's a methyl group, are changing these hormones to cause drastically different effects throughout the body. Finally, thyroid, everybody focuses on T4, levothyroxine synthroid. This is the hormone that's most dominant in terms of production from thyroid, but T3 is the most potent. You're taking off an iodine molecule here. T4 has four iodine, T3 has three, but yet one's more powerful because it has less iodine. And then reverse T3 is just the mirror image of the T3, and it is, it is inactive. But in cancer, what you see is that these thyroid hormones can actually promote the cancer growth. But the point here is that one change, one small change can have a significant impact in function, just as with ascorbic acid and sodium ascorbate. And here we're just giving you some examples of how this already exists in physiology. So why does it even matter? Why does, whether it's ascorbic acid or sodium ascorbate, why does it bother? Well, because my job as a physician and as medical director of Brio Medical is to treat people with all forms of cancer and other variety of autoimmune diseases, Lyme, et cetera, but it's to provide effective therapies, efficient and effective therapies. And if I can't therapeutically dose because something like ascorbic acid is pH negative, then I can't reach tolerability and compliance in my dosing. So I've got to introduce a therapy that's going to be pH neutral, tolerability. Thus, I'm going to be able to reduce side, side effects. I'm going to be able to increase the frequency of the dosing. The patient is going to be able to comply with the frequent dosing, the high dosing. And that is where we're going to get the pharmacological uh, effect of the vitamin C. So when you look at the vitamin C fundamentals, I mean, Linus, Pauling's back, Linus Pauling back in the 70s really said it well. He basically said, look, as a part of training, we, we understand how drugs need to be dosed, how drugs need to be delivered to the tissue and how we need to monitor that. But yet when it comes to something natural like vitamins, particularly here with vitamin C, it gets thrown out the door, it gets thrown out the window. What I tell our patients here at Brio is that being in the science, reading the research actually forces one to become more natural doing things holistic and natural doesn't imply you throw science out the window. In fact, being in the science requires you to be more natural. So the fundamentals, the fundamentals of vitamin C include pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, bioavailability, dosing, duration, frequency. Pharmacokinetics is simply understanding that the way the, body come, way the vitamin C comes into the body how it's absorbed into the body, how it's distributed throughout the body, how it interacts with the point of, point of action. Pharmacokinetics is really how something is delivered and how it gets to the point of action. Pharmacodynamics is just really looking at the side of action, the resulting effects and side effects. These are the mechanisms by which pharmacology has looked at drugs and utilized this to help patients. It also applies to natural therapies. And this is where a lot of people out there will use vitamin C and not dose it right because it doesn't get delivered right pharmacokinetically. You intuitively know this. When somebody's sitting next to somebody that's six foot five, 355 pounds, and you're five foot two and 120 pounds, and you're both getting 50 grams of vitamin C, you both have different types of cancer. And you're like, uh, this just doesn't seem quite right to me. Intuitively, you're right. It's because of pharmacokinetics that that is the case. Tumor burden also plays a role there. The deficiency of vitamin C in the individual plays a role there. The body size plays a role there. All of these come together to play a role. Bioavailability is just what we discovered the late uh, 19, uh, 1990s and early 2000, is that when you give vitamin C orally, it's not absorbed well. In fact, the more vitamin C you take by mouth, the more the gut downregulates the absorption of vitamin C. So that's why vitamin C failed as an oral therapy with the Mayo studies from Rochester. They completely did not understand that there's a difference in bioavailability of delivery of vitamin C by mouth versus IV. Dose, critical. We've got to reach a pro-oxidative dose. 
This begins at least one gram per kilogram, but typically 1.5 gram per kilogram. And then you must test to make sure that you're achieving therapeutic values. Then it's not just about dose, it's also about duration. We, we recognize, thank you to Dr. Reardon and others, that there's a certain plasma blood level of vitamin C that we wanna achieve. And the longer we can achieve that, the longer we can stay there, the more cancer cells we can, we can kill. So with therapeutic plasma ascorbic acid levels, that correlates directly with hydrogen peroxide, which again is the mechanism by which uh, vitamin C kills cancer cells, but it's through that prodrug hydrogen peroxide. The duration is to keep ourselves there as long as we can. Frequency, when you look at the vitamin C in healthy cells versus cancer cells, there's a difference. When they looked at research in liver, vitamin C in healthy liver cells is going to pretty much be eliminated in 16 hours. In the blood, it's gone in two hours. So in healthy tissue, vitamin C is used up, it's gone. But guess what? In cancer cells, not only do cancer cells have a higher affinity for vitamin C, but it holds on to it for up to 48 hours. So it's not just enough to use vitamin C. One has to recognize all of the intricacies that go into how to dose it, how to deliver it, how to monitor it, and how to maximize it. Because we can give somebody a dose of vitamin C that should be a high dose, say one gram per kilogram of vitamin C, which is a lot, by the way. And then you check plasma vitamin C levels, and they still need more. So you can't just give a dose and expect it to hold. You have to monitor it because that demand will go up and down. So when we look at the concept of vitamin C, it really comes down to these four critical parameters. Bioavailability. You can't treat cancer with oral vitamin C. In fact, there's research that suggests inadequate vitamin C can actually promote cancer stem cells. Let me repeat that because it's important. Inac inadequate dosing of vitamin C via the oral route actually could promote cancer stem cells. So this is why it's important to use vitamin C or get vitamin C if you're a patient by somebody who is using it therapeutically by design, by the science, by the evidence for a purpose. Then we wanna dose it right. You start off by dosing it by weight, then you wanna dose it for duration. We wanna achieve a therapeutic level in that blood, we wanna monitor it, and we wanna stay there as long as we can because we need this vitamin C to penetrate the tumor, to, pen to produce hydrogen peroxide. And here's another thing, there's areas within the tumor that are hypoxic, that lack oxygen, and those that have normal oxygen. The vitamin C is not gonna penetrate all those areas the same. Those areas that lack, lack oxygen, the vitamin C is not gonna penetrate that well, so you need higher doses of vitamin C. And then we gotta frequently give the dose. So if cancer cells will hold on to it up to 48 hours, a bare minimum is three times a week. So if you're getting vitamin C, 50 grams one time a week, and you're dealing with cancer, that is a therapeutic dose. That is a non-therapeutic dose that I would gauge may even be actually promoting the cancer. So why is vitamin C important? Well, I hope that I've been able to tell you that it kills cancer cells, but it, that can only happen with the right dose. The right dose is going to be different for each person. It's not necessarily going to be a word or a phrase, low dose, high dose, therapeutic dose, or pharmacological dose. The right dose is the dose that elicits the effect that we're after, which here it's to kill cancer cells. So if you have a small individual, 120, you know, 120 pounds, five foot two, it might be that you can give them 100 grams vitamin C their plasma ascorbic acid levels achieve 350 to 450 nanograms per deciliter. And you're gonna see significant pro-oxidative effect and cancer killing effects. But if you give that same dose to somebody, like I said, six foot six, 335 pounds, that right dose in that small individual is gonna be the low, a low dose in the other individual. So what we have to do is understand all the different parameters that come together to help us to achieve the right dose, which could be a low dose, could be a high dose, but it's to achieve a therapeutic dose, but primarily it's here to achieve a pharmacolog pharmacological dose, which is the production of hydrogen peroxide. See, vitamin C 
it's a natural therapy. It's a holistic therapy, but we're using it very differently. We have to use it big. We have to use it scientific. We have to use it as guided by the evidence because otherwise we're not going to get a therapeutic effect and we may actually hurt the person that is helped the cancer. So if we don't use it right, the oncologist will say, see, it doesn't work. But if we use it right, there's actually research that shows that high dose pro-oxidative vitamin C helps in chemotherapy and helps in radiation. The tide's turning on vitamin C. The science is showing that. Many doctors aren't up to speed on it, but if you're gonna use vitamin C in the treatment of cancer, please go to somebody like here at Brio, where, where we're gonna treat you as a patient with cancer, we're gonna follow the science in that. So why does it matter? Well, it's about dose, it's about duration, it's about bioavailability, should be frequency, a little bit of a typo there. Because what we're gonna do, it's gonna create oxidative stress within the cancer cell. Again, that hydrogen peroxide that gets produced outside the cancer cell gets taken up into the cancer cell preferentially. And within that, that's where you get what's called oxidative stress. You get this burst and it actually depletes the cancer cell of glutathione. It downregulates glutathione, which is a key detoxifying molecule. That is a mechanism by which it kills cancer cells. So if you're, if you're a patient with cancer, you have a loved one or family member with cancer, or you're a doctor treating cancer, you do not want to give them glutathione. You're actually potentially propagating the cancer. We want to deplete the cell of, of glutathione to kill it via vitamin C through hydrogen peroxide. We got to deliver it all through the tumor. There are different areas within the tumor, some with oxygen, some without. And that vitamin C has to be dosed to penetrate all of it, all of it. And we have to saturate that entire tissue. If we're going to kill a tumor, if we're going to shrink a tumor, we need to make sure we use the scientific, the bench scientific research behind vitamin C and really use it. Otherwise, the oncologist may be right, but when we use it right, we're right. And that's the science that shows that. And here's just a few studies here. And again, these are studies in people. These aren't studies in animals. These are studies in people. The, the last one, Let the Phoenix Fly, is more of a review article that it's reviewing a lot of different articles. And notice the one there from the um, frontier of oncology. It's 2021. A, a lot of the research on vitamin C has been really prominent prominent and propagated over the last 10 years or so. So really excited, exciting times for vitamin C, but there's a lot of misinformation and, and, and information out there that people aren't understanding. So when you look at the mechanisms of actions of vitamin C, it's really broad. And all of these are evidence-based reproducibly in the data, in the science. It's epigenetic, so it induces genetic expression changes in the cancer cells. It's directly cytotoxic to cancer cells, but not to healthy cells. This is key. It doesn't deplete the healthy cells of glutathione. It'll kill cancer cells and it won't, it won't, it won't hurt the healthy cells. It blocks the cancer cell growth. It's anti-proliferative. It actually turns off inflammation. Genetically, how it's transcribed, what's called uh, NF kappa B, it's a transcription factor for inflammation. Vitamin C turns it off. It blocks angiogenesis and lymphogenesis. Angiogenesis is the process by which blood vessels form for cancer and, and support it with its growth for nutrients in blood. Vitamin C blocks that. It triggers apoptosis. And I kind of mentioned that with the depletion of glutathione. It's much broader than that, but that's one mechanism. It actually is what's called immunomodulatory. It can stimulate natural killer cells. It can increase the number of natural killer cells and their activity and do the same with cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Both of these, I call them the Marine and the armies uh, of how the immune system attacks cancer. But it can, also, it can also suppress things that suppress the immune system in the tumor microenvironment. So what's called myelodeprived, myelodeprived suppressor cells and transforming growth factor beta. These are things in the tumor microenvironment that suppress the immune system that allow the cancer to turn the immune system on the immune system. Really interesting, but vitamin C will actually suppress that process. It is antiviral. I mean, we're coming out of the COVID uh, pandemic. Vitamin C is antiviral. You can take a look at your viruses, uh, whether it's sepsis or whether it's just viral infection alone, it's antiviral. 
broad and how its effects are. We don't have time to talk about that, but very evidence-based. It actually inhibits the mitochondrial membrane potential, which destroys the cell membrane potential, which destroys cancer cells. But it doesn't do that to healthy cells. I mean, is there a therapy out there that actually will kill cancer cells and not hurt healthy cells? It's vitamin C. It's actually anti-cancer stem cells. It'll kill cancer stem cells. Combine it with uh, doxycycline, it'll kill cancer stem cells. That's the backup you want no part of. It's anti-metastatic. So metastat metastasis is how cancer cells spread. And cancer cells, when they're circulating, they surround themselves with a ball of platelets called a cancer cell platelet aggregate. And that, that protects the platelets, excuse me, the cancer cell with those platelets, it buffers it from the immune system and this just sheer stress of the blood. And vitamin C comes in there and it inhibits that process and it allows natural killer cells to penetrate that cancer cell platelet aggregate. It does damage DNA when it's pro-oxidative. So if an oncologist tells you that vitamin C is antioxidative, if you take 2000 milligrams by mouth, he'd be right. But because of the difference of bioavailability that, that the Rochester studies misunderstood, that Linus Pauling even misunderstood, we now know when you dose vitamin C pro-oxidatively, pro high dose to deliver hydrogen peroxide to the tumor microenvironment and in the cancer, you will not only induce DNA damage for cancer cells that kills them, but you will augment that with radiation chemotherapy that's listed down below. It's a redox buffer. That it's, that's its primary mechanism of how vitamin C is killing cancer cells. It's donating electrons. It actually is changing what's called metabolomics. Now, new research in, in terms of where cancer is going, it's epigenomics, it's genomics, it's proteonomics, and it's metabolomics. Metabolomics is just the con collection of the metabolites. Vitamin C induces metabolomic changes in the cancer cells. Cancer cells are addicted to sugar and vitamin C comes in and turns enzymes off. So it's addicted to sugar and now can no longer use it. It actually targets hypoxia, which is the low oxygen. It actually promotes collagen. Some of the original research in, in cancer and vitamin C is that vitamins, that collagen or depletion of collagen was playing an integral role in how, in ca how cancer was spreading. And so adding vitamin C in helps. The extracellular matrix is involved in the tumor microenvironment. Vitamin C is critical in preserving the extracellular matrix and preserving an anti-tumor environment in the tumor microenvironment. I could talk for hours on the tumor microenvironment because that's where all the action is. It's a cofactor in many enzymatic functions. Again, it augments chemotherapy, it reduces side effects of chemotherapy. It augments radiation and reduces side effects of radiation. It augments surgery. Surgery suppresses the immune system. That's why you see local recurrence and you see spread. By the way, chemo, radiation, and surgery all spread cancer. They will shrink a primary tumor and spread it. So if we cause cancer to spread, which is why 90% of cancer mortality and morbidity exists, what have we really done? Vitamin C is a therapy that can actually, with surgery, help to reduce that recurrence locally and spread um, throughout the body. Vitamin C is integral in hormone metabolism, and it's great as an, as an immunotherapeutic alone, but it's great as working with conventional immunotherapeutic drugs today, like what are called immune checkpoint inhibitors that, are, that conventional medicine uses, and vitamin C has been shown to augment those therapies. So it's a therapy that stands alone, but it's a therapy that also works with conventional medicine. So it's a therapy that works everywhere. So here in Arizona, we're following the science using things like high dose vitamin C to target cancer, to heal the body. Here, here we are able to follow that science to do that. So here we can provide that to you. And also patients that come here, I encourage you to come here and just find how we do this. Now for docs that may be on here, you know, I speak at conferences. I'll be down at a conference in, uh, in September in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, vitamin C International Cons Consortium Institute, where we're going to actually talk about vitamin C in depth. So for docs there, but for patients, you know, here is where you need to come because we're going to use the science to treat cancer. We're going to use it in conjunction with conventional therapies if you're with an oncologist. But our goal here is to use the science to, 
to kill the cancer cells and not hurt you. So that is it. Uh, that's it on the slide presentation. A little bit of a deep dive there. So um, hope that was insightful and helpful. Got one question here, uh, not related to vitamin C, but could medroxyprogesterone acetate possibly lead to the development of reproductive cancer? Uh, the short is yes. Uh, medroxyprogesterone acetate is a progesterone analog. It's not progesterone, it's called a progestogen. Um, it is a drug that I wouldn't give to anybody. Uh, if, if a woman needs progesterone, you give them progesterone. It's like vitamin C, sodium ascorbate. It's the naturally occurring vitamin C. If you need to give somebody vitamin C, you give the naturally occurring vitamin C. It just seems to be the obvious, but that's what it is. Good question, Anna. Any other questions about vitamin C or about maybe your experience with vitamin C or maybe what somebody's told you about vitamin C? Okay, Kara, good question. Currently in treatment for ovarian cancer. Okay, bless you. Um, do you guys treat this cancer and how do we go about it? How do we get more information? Well, I encourage you to call our, our patient coordinators here and they can give you more information to understand how we treat patients that come here with ovarian cancer. We actually have two patients here right now. Um, vitamin C needs to be dosed carefully in ovarian cancer because of the situation of ascites, but it can be very helpful in that process. It can be helpful as a standalone therapy, but it can be helpful as a combination therapy uh, with what we do here is low dose chemo. And so as a standalone, but really in combined therapy is the key there. But with ovarian cancer, you have to begin, be very careful because the ascites, that, that fluid that develops in the belly, that volume of fluid with a vitamin C has to be managed and watched very, very carefully. So uh, yes, we do that. We have two patients here right now, advanced ovarian cancer. So call our patient coordinators and they'll be able to give you more detailed information. Okay, great, great question, Valerie. Can vitamin C be taken while, give it, while getting radiation? Yes, there are studies actually out there right now published human studies showing that high dose vitamin C, it needs to be pro-oxidative, very important. That's high dose, the hydrogen peroxide, that pro-oxidative vitamin C when used with radiation. There was a study that actually looked at doing it one hour before and one hour after. It didn't matter if it was before or after. The point is one hour before or one hour after, actually the vitamin C and the, and the radiation did better together. So yes, it can be taken together. It should be used together. So if you're told that vitamin C is an antioxidant, that in part is true. But if it's dosed right, it can be pro-oxidative and be used with radiation. How does vitamin C work in treating cancer? Uh, good question. Well, it depends on the type of cancer there. Um, if we're talking about melanoma, uh, that tends to be a very aggressive cancer cell. It's very metabolically active. It's growing very fast. And understand when a cancer is growing fast like that, it takes up the sugar readily and very rapidly. And vitamin C looks just like sugar. So it's almost like a Trojan horse. So in that kind of cancer, vitamin C is very, very effective. Um, topically, uh, people will use topical vitamin C for skin cancers such as squamous cell carcinomas or uh, basal cells. Um, it's helpful there, but it's more of a systemic therapy. Uh, for example, like with melanoma, or if even a squamous cell carcinoma has moved systemically, which is very rare. Tune in late, can I take vitamin C by mouth and be sufficient? That's what I assume, Curtis, you're acting, asking there. If you're wanting to treat cancer, Curtis, the answer is no. The evidence is very clear on that. And actually there was uh, some studies out of uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota back in 1978, 1985, that showed how oral vitamin C has no effect on advanced cancer. Now that was different because Linus Pauling and 
you and Cameron just a few years earlier had showed that 10 grams, but of IV vitamin C actually did a significant and statistical lengthening of patients' uh, one-year survival rate. The difference was that oral vitamin C, you, it's, it has what's called very low bioavailability. And it's not going to achieve a therapeutic level, and it's not going to achieve peak de uh, delivery to the cancer cell. We not only have to achieve a therapeutic level, we have to saturate the tumor. And there's a lot of demands for vitamin C and oral vitamin C won't cut it. And as I mentioned earlier, since you came in late, the more, the more vitamin C you take by mouth, Curtis, the more the gut decreases its absorption of it. So an, initially within the first 10 to 15 minutes, you'll see a spike of blood vitamin C levels, but low with oral. And then after that, it drops as you continue to take it orally. And that's because the gut down regulates the absorption of that. Great question. Um, how do you monitor tolerance of IV, uh, in IV vitamin C? Well, tolerance, you monitor it basically symptomatically. I've dosed people as high as 300 grams and it's well tolerated. Most of it is just simply you know, uh, seeing the patient, the nurses keeping track, being aware of what symptoms to look out for. Understand that high dose vitamin C is not devoid of side effects. Uh, you may have some shivers, you may get cold, you may have some shakes. That's pretty rare. You may get some headaches, pretty rare. Most often what we see is actually people get tired, especially at the real high doses. But again, understand we're using vitamin C to actually destroy cancer. And we're following the science in that. So if you have a therapy that doesn't, you don't lose hair, you don't get ulcers, you don't get blood clots, but yet systemically kills cancer cells, but doesn't damage healthy cells. And yet you get a little bit of fatigue while you're getting the IV vitamin C. That's a therapy that most of our patients have no issues with. In fact, I would say all of our patients have no issues with. Now I would say this, vitamin C, you have to be careful with people with kidney function. It can be given. So it's not devoid of side effects that are significant but it needs to be monitored with things like blood levels, it needs to be monitored clinically, it needs to be monitored, monitored via urine. So all of these are how we monitor them to make sure that not only do we see symptoms when they occur, but we, we see people that are gonna have problems before they do. Okay, Cecilia, good question. How do I find an integrative doctor in the St. Louis area that is experienced in treating cancer with IV vitamin C? Uh, you know, good question. I wish it was a good question, uh, a question that I had to answer for you, for Cecilia. Um, we're here in Arizona because we have, you know, we have the dual license system. And so we're able to use high dose vitamin C's. I can't tell you if there's anybody in the St. Louis area that can do that. Um, but uh, that's why patients come here. It's for this high dose vitamin C. I can tell you, I came to Arizona so I could do this and other therapies because the states I was at before, I couldn't. So that's why I'm here. That's why I'm at Brio. Uh, so that's what I would tell you is if, if you could come out here or at least talk to our patient care coordinators, they could give you more information about that. Okay, somebody, I know somebody else answered a, asked a question there. It's not populating. I hope what I've been able to do here is show you that, and, and we didn't, this was just skipping the surface. I'm a, I'm a biochemical junkie, I'm a nerd. You know, so you know, what, do, what do I do in my free time? On Saturday mornings, I have a cup of coffee, I read research and I write. I know I'm a nerd, but what we wanna do is we wanna use holistic natural therapies that actually work. We don't wanna destroy the body. We want to destroy the cancer and heal the body. And so when we use vitamin C, the science is actually there to show us how. It's science that's been around for a long time. And it's science that's really coming back full circle. So we're going to have to protect it because I think conventional medicine is going to come, come in and try to take it. But I think the science is on our side. It's great as a standalone therapy. It's great and used in conjunction with other holistic therapies. It's even great to use it with conventional oncology, surgery, and radiation. And that's the science. And you're just only going to see more of it. Somebody's raising their hand.
Okay, for question, um, do you accept insurance? Again, just call the um, patient care coordinators there on that last page. Reach out to the clinic. How long does it take to run 300 grams IV vitamin C? Oh, great question, great question. Uh, a long time. Uh, duration is the key here. So typically with 300 grams, I mean, you're talking about seven, eight hours. So it's a long, it's a long vitamin C. There's no doubt. Um, you tend to get dry mouth with that, but it's, it's well tolerated, but it's an incredible therapy. So just as somebody might get chemotherapy, you know, go home with it and have it long term. Vitamin C is something you can actually go home with. Um, not, I wouldn't recommend you do it there, but it's something I've done in the past. Can someone be trained to dose and deliver IV vitamin C at home? Uh, great question. Um, because of the potential risks with IV vitamin C and because of the typical high risk associated with people with cancer, uh, high dose vitamin C is really something that should be done under the guidance of a physician with a nurse that has the ability to recognize uh, early symptoms but also a physician that's gonna be able to identify people at risk and follow them closely. I actually had a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma that we were able to give low dose vitamin C. Uh, we gave him 50 grams, but we had to watch his kidneys like a hawk uh, because vitamin C can tax the kidneys a mm -hmm. little bit. And so you just have to follow these and be aware of that and just uh, be able to use these therapies for everybody. Great questions, y'all, really great questions. So it could go much deeper, um, but you know, I, I wanted to kind of keep it kind of on the surface uh, because again, sometimes it get too deep in the weeds and uh, just, you know, those of us that are just organic chemistry and biochemical junkies, we, we kind of will talk past people. So I hope it's been helpful and show you how this science is guiding, not just one action of vitamin C in cancer, but how it guides many different actions, but how it's a standalone therapy why sodium ascorbate is different than ascorbic acid, why the dosing is important, why the duration is important, why the frequency is important, it's because we need to kill cancer cells, not the body, we need to kill cancer cells. So I hope this has been helpful. Look for this to be something that we do on a regular basis. Um, I encourage you to come back. We'll announce beforehand uh, what the topic will be. And I look forward to seeing everybody there again and answer any questions that you may have. God bless to everybody. And uh, have a great day.